Welcome again, everyone. This is the fifth lecture on the simulation aesthetics, illusion and limitations. What happens when ceramic looks like other material is a very important aspect of ceramic aesthetics. And it has a long history. One of the early precursor was Bernard Palissy, working in the 16th century in France. I believe he was one of the first to make plaster molds and to cast live forms and reassemble them in ceramics in wonderful dishes and all kinds of exciting ways. And you can see on the left that the results can be very naturalistic and, and quite credible. But he would also do work where he would reverse things and the water aspect of the dish are now white and the shell aspect are now blue so he has reversed the color combinations of those two things to create work that is quite specifically ceramics now bernard palissy as we will see later has a lot of followers all the way to today this is an example here by miriam webster talking about pollution about genetic manipulation about all those issues that are very current now but you can see clearly the influence of Bernard Palissy in the making of her work we have all kinds of examples from you know somewhat parlor jokes from the 18th and 19th century made by all kinds of companies and factories all over Europe and so on where ceramic imitates nuts imitate fruits and flowers and and all kinds of material and you were to pass those around or set them on the table and people would try to pick one up and of course everything is fused together and you can't handle and it's, it's a big surprise and it's a lot of fun but what's interesting in those work for me is that if the fruit or the nut is fake is the plate a real plate or is it a fake plate a plate imitating a plate that's also quite interesting and we will look at ceramic imitating ceramics later on so there are all kinds of wares being made throughout the centuries where there is an imitation of all kinds of material in ceramics an interpretation of that in a very loose and improvised way by Pablo Picasso and the Portuguese there's the Portuguese were great master of this type of wear and they've made those types of work for a long time there are still factories in Portugal making that type of work today and someone like Vic Nunes going to one of those factory and making work today that reworks the potential of ceramics to imitate various material and in the process create commentary on contemporary society of great potency while other maker like Dudit Taillère use that potential to make functional wear this has been done again all over Europe for a long long time in all kinds of places and this is a newer more current interpretation of that potential in our work Ceramic can imitate metal very readily with the use of lusters, metal lusters, gold, silver, all kinds of surfaces can be achieved. I have here a brief selections of artists working with ceramic imitating metals for all kinds of reasons to create teapots, to create objects, to challenge the nature of material and the potential of ceramics to challenge you to reassess how material behaves and what is the importance of material in art appreciation and interpretation somebody like clint neufeld for example making his extraordinary slip cast motors all assembled from multiple parts that are then put back together there is no real imitative aspect at the level of surface here the surface is readily ceramics with the addition of decorative elements and decals coming from a domestic context which is reinforced by the use of furniture in the display strategies for his work here the work of Jeremy Atch where he has made objects that hides their internal components that can then be revealed by x-rays of the work and Koi Nakamura from Japan again imitating all kinds of metals and creating those extremely baroque rococo sculptural forms 
that imitate wood and imitate metal and imitate plastic and all of those things coming together in a very over-the-top fashion. Many makers working today and in historical time as well have imitated flowers. This is just a selection of the possibilities of how clay and ceramics can imitate organic forms and sometimes there is a stylization at work and sometimes a, a, a tremendously realistic um, reproduction of the flowers and there is all kinds of approaches to that problem. I just wanted you to be aware of those makers and you may want to research them further if you are more curious about that type of work. But um, this is all quite recent work made by artists from all over the world. Sometimes there is great abstraction of both the, the form and the surface, the use of digital printing, digital deco making can add to the realism of the surface while the form is highly abstracted and stylized. And um, people do this for all kinds of reasons. I've introduced that previously in the decorative aesthetics in the use of the floral in decoration. And those are makers combining this with the principle of illusion and imitation that are part of the simulation aesthetics. In Vancouver, the wonderful work of Giddy Fogg working with fruits in the 1970s. In Cuba, this um, rice and beans dish completely made in ceramics. Again, if the rice and the beans are ceramics and faked, is the dish a fake dish as well? Interesting questions. And all kinds of food is can be made in ceramics as well. This is the work of David Geluli with a bagel frog and a, a huge sandwich all of made with ceramic material. On the right, we will look at aspect of that in the food thematic lecture later on. This is just a brief introduction today. Shell and underwater teams are also very popular in ceramics. This is a beautiful example from Capodimonte, Italy from 1745. And you have it as well at the level of surface, which is something we will look into coming on. But those shells are painted and then the vessel itself imitates marble, imitates gold, imitates all kinds of other material. You have an artist like Kyoko Tokumaru from Japan working with underwater and shell themes in her work. And again, I'm just showing you a selections of various makers who have used that potential of ceramics to imitate things and combine it with other materials, sometimes other references like chicken feet, sometimes in a very abstract way where it's more a referential aspect that makes you think of underwater themes instead of imitating things like in Ying Wei Chuang. Wonderful work. And uh, again, those artists come from all over the world. Sometimes there is quite a shift in scale. The work can be very big and become installation art through various strate strategies of display, like in the work of Christopher Adams or Courtney Madison. But it is quite interesting to consider that so many makers now are using this theme of references to shell and underwater structures and growth form to make work of great vari variety. Let's talk a bit about the simulation surface as well, which is another quite interesting aspect of ceramic. And at the Otsuka Museum in Naruto City, Japan, they have reproduced very famous works of art on true scale ceramic tiles using printing and digital technologies to make decals of great trueness to the original. And now that those have been installed have been reapplied on ceramic tiles. They can be installed outside the museum. They can be weathered. They can be um, under snow and rain. They will probably survive the original. Here we have The Last Judgment by Michelangelo on the left and The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci on the right. And in the museum, there are hundreds of famous work of art reproduced on ceramic tiles in such a fashion, which is quite an interesting phenomenon when you consider it. Alice Marat making plates with all kinds of references to domestic contexts. 
or here people working with the idea of the abject or, or the repulsive by doing things like putting flies and uh, ants and all kinds of insects all over wares. So ceramics can imitate plastics, rubber, fruits, all kinds of things. There are a lot of people working with imitations of wood surfaces. This is work from the 1950s from France, work from the 1970s by Howard Cutler, an artist who makes his presence felt in a lot of those lectures because he is a tremendously influential and a precursor in so many ways in the use of what would be called conceptual approaches to ceramics making. People creating all kinds of illusions of space as well at the level of 2D surfaces. And there are quite a few of those artists making work where the difference between flatness and volume between 2D and 3D is illusionistic and gives you the impression of things being positioned in space in ways that are not true in reality. So this approach to simulation uh, is, is quite interesting as well and I just wanted you to be aware of that amazing potential. For example, in this, uh, those two works by Mineo Mizuno, some of the cups are painted and one of the cup is an actual three-dimensional cup and which is which is an interesting visual game being played here on this work which combines many of those aspects in a singular work. And here we have a drawing in underlay pencil by Vern Funk, where um, those illusion principles are um, explored. So there can be four different types of simulation. And the first one is called the realist object. And there will be more about those four differences in the reading assigned for this lecture for this week's course, but the characteristic of the realist object is that although it imitates something, you know very clearly that you're looking at ceramics. There is always a clue that tells you that this is something made out of ceramics, that it could not be made out of the original material like metal here in the case of Ai Weiwei's uh, metal bars. Because of the use of color, all of a sudden it becomes something else. Or because fruit are assembled to create teapots, they cannot be fruits anymore. And one reads the ceramicness of the object quite readily and there is no intent to uh, create an illusion in the realist object. And examples of that come from various cultures in historical times, but Yixing teapots from 17, 18, 19, and all the way to today in China often use those principles of the realist objects to make ceramic objects that are composed of rather realistically modeled and assembled forms. More recently, the work of Richard Nutkin is one of the great master of the realist objects where skulls become teapot and um, nuclear towers become all kinds of objects and um, teapots b made with chains and arts and so on and so forth. So that um, again, he imitates but transform and makes it into a completely new object like in the work of Wu Min who is one of the great master of Yixing ware working in China today and work referencing bamboo for example and um, just again to introduce you to a few makers who I think use the principles of the realist objects by making things that are clearly ceramic things but references all kinds of sources like uh, cabbages and uh, that become lamps or alley on where wood ceramics become wood and becomes a bridge and because of its installation in the context of a museum one r s understands all of those transference that takes place in his work or Marilyn Levine whose work will be seen again and analyzed again a bit later making cups as if they were made out of athletic wear, where the, um, the strings are actually actual fabric or leather and 
and so on. So by the combination of you know TVs and computers becoming ceramic because of their surface decoration, which creates a, a very interesting contrast and conflict between the coming together of ceramic as a material, specifically ceramic surfaces, within the context of here a, a bottle cast from an original in glass. Or those references to Coca-Cola again, you know, glass becoming ceramic and then being decorated in specific ways to comment on contemporary society. And Mortimer making umbrellas out of porcelain and again that transference, you know, like what 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 meaning is generated by this change, this transference, this modification of an object into a completely different material, which can then not, it's not possible for it to be folded. It, 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 lo it lost its function. It becomes metaphorical and very poetic in all kinds of ways. The work of Brendan Tang is of a similar nature as well, where ceramics looks like ceramic. This is again ceramic imitating ceramics, which we will see a bit later on. And then ceramic imitating plastic, imitating metal, imitating rubber. And uh, uh, again, to challenge you to reassess the meaning of the transference of material and the role of material in ceramic aesthetics and art appreciation, which is also something that happens with the work of Charles Kraft, that I have shown you before, or this work here, where again we read those objects as clearly ceramic objects, although their reference are domestic utensils and apparels coming from our homes and things made out of wood becoming something else, uh, teapots made out of metal on the right, uh, wood again becoming a vase, becoming a sculptural piece, and uh, keeping its clearly ceramic uh, reference through a shift in scale, through a complete transference into a new material that speaks of memory, of nostalgia, of uh, fragility, and all kinds of psychological states uh, with which ceramics can contribute greatly to the potential of psychological experience in art. And this is an example again of that by Jeremy Hatch, those love locks made out of ceramics. And, and again, the ceramic brings in fragility and, and all of those issues of great psychological poten potency. And people go through, you know, through the use of large scale and reproducing all kinds of amazing objects in ceramics. This has been happening more and more recently. And I want you to be aware of this potential. Liu Jianhua, again, with cast of all kinds of objects that are that then become clearly ceramic objects, although the reference to the original source is very obvious. And people using those references to make all kinds of works to, again, engage with the experience of the viewer in um, challenging and confrontational ways. Rubber boots becoming porcelain vases, Porcelain becoming objects that, that are impossible, that don't make any sense, that could not sustain the stress of use implied by the form itself. Or ceramic becoming bodily references and sexual references that again um, challenge you to reassess a lot of those things. Ceramic becoming fruits, becoming um, animals and uh, inventions, you know, like, like again, s such a thing doesn't exist in nature. So it is a complete work of imagination, but the reference is still quite clear. In my own work, porcelain teapot imitating fabric, but not in an illusionistic way, one is still very much aware of the ceramic nature of not only the form, but the surface and the coming together of the two. Jason Walker, again, referencing metal and wood and all kinds of material, but in a context that it stresses and enhances the ceramicness of the thing. Porcelain teeth and dental porcelain are also part of that category of, um, you know, ceramics imitating other things and ceramic becoming lungs, becoming birds, 
and but the, by the completion of the two, one is completely aware of the ceramicness of the objects we are looking at. So the realist object is one of the main and largest category of work within the simulation aesthetic. And for example, those wonderful bags by Georgette Cournoyer, where one sees clearly the, the, the way it's made with the slab that's been reassembled into the shape of the bag. We'll be looking at bags later on. But there is no illusionistic intent here. The ceramicness of this object is clearly manifested and stressed by the making and by the form itself. While in the work of Marilyn Levine, for example, we have what is called a trompe -le in ceramics, where the illusion is so perfect and exact and believable that one is absolutely convinced one is looking at leather, although this is all made out of ceramics. And this is a category that will be coming up. But first, let's look at the hyperreal object, which is the second category of simulation in ceramics, where again, there is such an illusion that it's, it's totally believable that this is a real pencil, real twig over paper, real rock, real scissor. But the way they are, contextualize makes you aware of the fact that this is impossible that it be made out of rock and metal that it, that it has to be made out of another material which happen to be ceramics and the hyperreal object is quite an interesting category and in the work of Stefano de la Porta this ashtray for example looks absolutely real and convincing but it is about a meter wide and the same thing with the object on the right, it's a very large scale reproduction of a very tiny thing. And this shift in scale, although those objects are made realistically and very convincingly and illusionistically because of the shift in scale, one understands them in a completely different way. And this is what I mean by the hyperreal object. Now, there is a third category which we could call the surreal object where a ceramic objects become something else by the addition of another material like fur, in this example by Merit Oppenheim from the 1930s, or by creating somewhat, you know, nightmarish or dreamlike worlds of combination of a hand holding a fish coming out of a pillow or toes sticking out of a cup in the work of Carol Mechnikoff. Or the wonderful work of Tsan Chung Zing where, um, again, there is a surreal approach to the making of those things out of ceramic material. And another example of his work here, which is quite amazing and hard to believe that this is actually ceramic, but it is. And this creates a surreal impression of great efficiency. And there are very few examples of this type of work, but they tend to be quite amazing, quite extraordinary, and quite potent for that reason. And the fourth category is the trompe l'oeil object. And the trompe l'oeil of le object means fooling the eye, where you're looking at something that looks like the original, that is the source and the, the ins inspirations for the work in ceramic. And Marilyn Levine is the great master of the trompe l'oeil object in ceramic. She has worked over decades making quite extraordinary work within that specific aesthetic in ceramic. And Alion is another one of the gr those great makers, making work of a total trompe l'oeil, full the eye, believability. And I'm just showing you the example of a few artists working in that aesthetic. And by dipping actual textiles into ceramic slip, one can can capture the extreme realism of the form and the, the quality of the material itself. And those are two examples of those types of work made in porcelain. Richard Shaw is also one of the great masters of the trompe l'oeil objects, where he makes things of such a believable realism that one actually believes that one is looking at a book or a set of cards and so on. More recently, Jeff Koons has explored this potential as well by making work in ceramics. And, and younger makers following in his footsteps 
uh, casting all kinds usually casting is at the center of the trompe l'oeil aesthetics although it's not at all in the case of Marilyn Levine where the work is completely unbuilt but certainly those two objects would have been slip cast using very complex molds um, and just introducing you to the work of a few makers here again who use the trompe l'oeil objects to create very interesting work that combines aspect of the realist object, the hyperreal object, the surreal object, sometimes within the trompe l'oeil as well, to make work that is quite amazing and quite impressive. That is always an impression with that category of, look how what I can do. I bet you can't do something like this. I'm, 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 I'm amazingly good at reproducing things. Um, there is a show-off quality to that work that I find interesting as well. And those are some of the great masters of the form coming from all over the world. And you're looking at work sometimes that you can hardly believe that what you're looking at is actually completely made out of ceramics. And again, you know, references to metal, references to food are quite common, but everything you're looking at here is a ceramic made form making furniture out of ceramics. And you know, like what happens when you transfer a, a, a chair into ceramics and, and how do you respond to that new object? What is your relationship to it? What is your experience of it? Could you sit on it? What would happen if you did sat on those chairs? Would they sustain the weight of your body or would they crumble under it? And there is a feeling of danger or vulnerability and the, the fragility, the inherent fragility of ceramic as a material is stressed by those works. Now there are also a large variety of works made with bags, boxes, boots and books, which we will see again in the text thematic lecture later on. But one of the precursor of using bags in ceramic is Victor Sikansky in Regina, Canada around 1969 and he went on to make those wonderful preserves and pickles later on but um, Robert Arneson may have been uh, doing something similar early on but with a non-illusionistic or you know the reference is so um, removed from the source that um, it, it although it is a bag it's, it's not clearly one. And again, the work of Victor Spinsky, making boxes, making bags. Uh, Bertuzzi and Casoni from Italy, again, making re those kinds of references in their work. Robert Rauschenberg made um, ceramic work with uh, flattened boxes uh, of a very interesting interest. One of the first ceramic cast paper bag, I believe, is from 1973, and again, it's a work by Howard Cutler called The Old Bag Next Door is Nuts. And um, I, I think he was the first one to take a paper bag, make a mold of it, and then cast it into ceramics. And then there are many, many followers of Owen Cutler since that time. Just the following year, Michel Harvey in Montreal, Vernon Patrick with his extraordinary presidential bag, and people have been making bags in ceramic ever since. And again, we find examples of that from all over the world. Sometimes there is a stylization or a simplification of the form, but the reference is still very clear. Sometimes there is a great realism in the quality of the products made out of cast ceramic. Casting has to be at the center of this process, of course. And it's quite interesting the way sometimes they become ceramic objects again at the level of glazing and surface while sometimes the illusion is quite phenomenally efficient. Li Shan Zhang from China. So it is quite interesting to consider why people make bags and boxes and uh, in, in ceramics, you know, because a bag and a box is still a container. It still speaks of containment, which is one of the main concept of ceramics. It still speak of volume and the connection between image and object that I've been discussing uh, so far and will discuss again in, for in future lectures. But bags are also very metaphorical objects. They speak of movement, of displacement in space. Uh, they bring in all kinds of memories and psychological states. 
and uh, if you go on the internet and google ceramic bags you get pages and pages of people who made ceramic bags all the way to today and that in itself is quite an interesting phenomenon that's a bit funny and a bit ridiculous but there it goes and then there are many people making shoes as well interestingly enough basically for somewhat the same reason because a shoe is also a container it has a deep reference to human bodies and human activities and human states and so on it references style and fashion and um, you know ethnicity and cultural backgrounds and and all of those issues can be explored further by referencing them through the use of a shoe here we have a very amazing shoe by jason briggs making references to bodies and to sexuality and so on people make shoes because a shoe represents a single individual and a lot of memorials to the holocaust or, or to all kinds of um, events, historical events, often incorporate shoes. And again, the work of Giddy Falk from Vancouver, working in the 70s, making her piles of fruits and all kinds of objects in ceramic, but also her wonderful shoes. Luigi Antani from Italy. Um, all kinds of people, four examples here, four different artists working with ceramic shoes. And, um, you know, it's a very interesting question to ask. Why do such a thing and what happens when you do such a thing? Making references to your culture, the fact that Australia, uh, everybody wears flip-flops where, and they were first invented in Australia. But um, everybody basically comes from England, which is where the blue willow pattern comes from. And the conflation of the two speaks of that um, historical background. So, you know, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of makers making hundreds of shoes for all kinds of reasons. And I, I, I'm not going to analyze each one of those objects in depth here. But, you know, keep in mind, again, the connections to human bodies, human activities, and also the fact that shoes are containers. And they speak of fragility once they're made into ceramics. And um, all those transference uh, imply all kinds of wonderful metaphor, poetic state, poetic states, and psychological effects. Now I have a selection that I call the Children of Palissy. I've started this lecture by showing you work by Bernard Palissy and, and many artists throughout the 20th century, like Lucio Fontana, whose work will come again in the material aesthetic lectures later on by using crabs and fishes and underwater forms and approaching the making of ceramics in exciting ways is, is what I call it a, a children of Palissy, who was the first to use those kinds of images and their transference into ceramics to make amazing work. And Jobova here with snakes, again, you know, snakes are a specific Palissy image and trope in his work and references to plants and flowers. I'm not saying that any of those people are imitating Palissy in any way, but by combining things coming from the actual world, transferring them into ceramics through mold making, and then recomposing complex tableau and organizations of forms in original and interesting ways to make you aware of the um, you know, like that amazing transference that happens when things that were not ceramic originally become ceramics all of a sudden. And again, Bernard Palissy was one of the first to do such a thing, to put a fish on a dish and and see what happens. And Patti Warashina does the same thing today. Bobby Silverman is another one. The format of the oval plate, the snake, the organic references, the references to water, in his work. So th this is work that follows in the footstep of a ceramic artist from 16th century France, making work that speaks of cultural origin, of ethnicity, of religion, of, uh, of all kinds of things. And um, sometimes in a very abstract way, but, but again, when, at the level of sensibility of putting things together that are not supposed to be together, 
I believe those artists are what I call children of Pellissi. And then it's, it's, it is quite interesting to consider the genealogy of this work and, it, and the reference to the past that it implies. And uh, we're getting close to the end here, but there's still this amazing category called ceramics imitating ceramics, which is a very interesting aspect of the simulation aesthetic. Those are slip cast and glazed objects imitating handmade and unglazed forms coming from Aboriginal cultures. Well, the work of Michael Frimkes, again, that I have introduced before, because he's tremendously influential and important. You know, this is ceramics imitating ceramics. Or Howard Cutler, again, making work that make references to mold making, to how an object is used and, and how it is, what is, what kind of experience does it create for us, and, and contesting and challenging those things. Um, and making you aware even more of that great potential of ceramics to create extraordinary human experiences. Or what is the nature of form and surface and, um, you know, making all kinds of transference and references through the use of kitsch and multiplicity and industrial references like we will see in the next lecture. A ceramic work that is basically as much a, a work about pot and pottery making and vessel forms than it is a form in itself. Or Michael Lucero making references to George Orr. So it, it is again a form of ceramics imitating ceramics while creating work of great originality. Ken Price making references to the folk pottery of Mexico in his very sophisticated work of the 1970s. Bruce Levan making a water bottle in ceramics as if it was reconstituted from broken shards from historical archaeological time, making reference at the level of decoration of Mimbra's objects from around 1000 AD. This amazingly bad image of an imitation Mimbra's platter that you could buy in any shop in the 1960s David Furman again, ceramic imitating ceramics, a cup that becomes another cup, or a paper cup that becomes um, a ceramic object. And so it looks like a paper cup, but it's not a paper cup. But cups are understood as ceramic, you know, typical ceramic form. And again, a New York porcelain coffee cup imitating an, a New York paper cup. The wonderful work of Richard Millet, completely composed out of faux shards coming from a wide repertory of ceramic surfaces and ceramic forms to create new work that make you aware of that potential of ceramics to reference the past, but be relevant in the present while it projects itself into, into the future. The work of Jeanette de Boos, where she has thrown form of the, on the wheel made plaster molds of those forms and then make multiples of those forms through slip casting. And if the original could only be unique now that it has been reproduced through plaster uh, casting, each one is an exact reproduction of, of the form. So that's, that's an original transference as well. Many artists working in ceramic today make all kinds of references to historical precedent. Japanese tea wares are very popular in that sense. And then you have people who make work of such extraordinary believability, even at the level of human bodies, like Tip Toden, that this illusion, it, again, this is a trompe l'oeil effect where the illusion is absolute. And Judy Fox is one of another master of that approach of sculpt to sculptural ceramics imitating human forms and human bodies. And then you have the weird phenomenon of plastic imitating ceramic, plastic oribe, plastic chino, or plastic Lebanon slipware. And the wonderful work of the uh, sculptor Robert Terrien, which uses dishes 
made at a very large scale. Each one of those dishes is about a meter and a half wide, and then they're stacked in huge piles. So those kinds of transference are found in other art form, like sculpture, for example. But within ceramics, it is interesting to consider what happens when ceramics become plastic uh, or when plastic becomes ceramics, as in the case of this water jar from Guatemala, which is the last images I'm showing you today. And um, think about it. See you next time. Thank you.